director here since 2006. I started on February 21st. It was oh, wow. my first day in 2000. Or, yeah, 2006. Happy New Year anniversary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, we've come a long way since that time and have just some wonderful folks both on our board and as staff helping to protect lands around the lower shore. Um, I do want to acknowledge a few people here. Um, we've got a couple board members. We've got Charlene Sharp and Tracy Quasi Jeffrey. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, today too, because it's so important that our board also participate and know what we're doing behind the scenes to keep these lands protected. Um, so just briefly, um, Lower Shore Land Trust, most of you know, has been in operation since 1990. Um, so we also are an accredited organization, which means that we do our best to follow not only the standards and practices of a nonprofit, but the standards and practices put forth by the Land Trust Alliance and the Land Trust Commission, which ensures best governance, best transactions, best land protection, best stewardship, um, and a bunch of other things that we're constantly changing. They're constantly moving that bar. Um, so we are actually in the process of submitting our renewal. We were accredited five years ago, and on Wednesday, we have to, by Wednesday, we have to submit our renewal. So many of you have made it possible. Um, our previous Golden Clipboard awardee, um, Laura here, um, really helped make it possible that we could get, um, working with Frank and, and Jerry to get our baseline um, um, reports done um, for really old easements that just didn't hit the mark. Um, so you're gonna learn a little bit about how, why that's so important and why it's so important that you know we, when we protect a piece of property, um, that we stay with it forever to make sure that those conservation values are upheld. Whether those are easements that have been purchased with grant funds from the state or federal government, or whether the landowner donated an easement and took tax benefits, we have to make sure that what was trans those transactions that were intended to uphold the conservation values for all of us for clean air, clean water, habitat, recreation, resiliency, that those stay in place going forward. Um, so while sometimes we seem like the bad guy when we're trying to make sure a buffer, it stays as wide as, it, as it's supposed to, the bottom line is that in order to uphold these easements, we need to have really good landowner communications. And so there's a whole lot that we do, but Today, we're gonna to be focused on the stewardship of these easements and how these programs work um, and some of the, um, the programs that support that also. Um, housekeeping, I suggest if you have, need to use the restroom, just go around that way um, and it's on this wall. Um, if you really find that you're, you know, need toothpicks to keep your eyes open, um, there's coffee in the back room too. Um, and is there anything else I need to say? Well, there's donuts back there too. Oh, yeah. Donuts, <laughs> donuts, donuts and bagels. Donuts and bagels. Donuts and bagels. Donuts donuts and bagels. Um, so, without further ado, I think um, Jared Parks, our land programs manager, is going to kick it off. And then um, Frank is going to. Um, oh, I also want to recognize so, not, most of you know Frank Duder, who's our stewardship coordinator. Mm -hmm. But you may not, you may or may not have met Kaylee Justice. She is our restoration manager. If you remember Suzanne, she's doing the work there. So we're really excited to have her on board. And Beth Shepard is our agricultural outreach specialist. So she's been doing a fantastic job getting quail habitat um, lined up and um, working with, with folks. Um, so thank you guys. So I'm just gonna run through a few early slides, um, sort of an add on to what Kate was saying. Uh, so the mission uh, of the Lower Shore Land Trust is protect and restore natural resources, wildlife habitat, and working lands, and uh, to support connected, healthy, and vibrant communities. So um, everything that we try to do here is to support that. Um, and uh, you know, it's pretty important for a nonprofit to actually have and stick with their mission. Um, and so it's always important to keep this in mind with everything that we're doing, um, because that's why we exist. Um, we have a, a fairly uh, broad and uh, very talented board. Uh, as Kate said, 
said, we have two members uh, here today, uh, and uh, we try to keep the board uh, populated with people across the lower three counties in a whole bunch of different fields, uh, so they can bring a, a, a number of different expertise to the organization to help us out and uh, keep us uh, functioning. Um, in the building we are now, the uh, Lower School Conservation and Heritage Center. Um, it's uh, been a pretty important thing. We moved into here, what, seven years ago? 2016, we moved 2016. in here, Sorry. and over the Six next couple ago. of years, we worked with a variety of programs <laughs> to <laughs> develop what you see here around you as our um, exhibits and interpretation of what we do, um, supported in part by the Maryland Heritage Areas. So that's good. Yeah, so if you have a chance, it's, it, uh, you know, walk around and, and see what's on the walls and, and the cases. Uh, I think we're gonna do a little bit of uh, upgrade to the cases soon, so um, see the stuff that we have now before we uh, change things out. Um, so, uh, as Katie said, we do a whole lot of different things, and we're going to go over a few of these during this presentation, but the main thing that we do and have always done is conservation easements. So that's at the top of the list. Um, and then, uh, once we do the conservation easements, we have to do the stewardship piece because the conservation easements are forever and always. Uh, and then we also work with, a lot of people know that we do our native plant sale, uh, and uh, as a you know, companion to that, we work with invasive species management uh, and education, uh, and we also do things like soil health and you know, trying to work with people to put best management practices in the ground, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna go over sort of conservation easements because that's where my sort of expertise lies. Uh, and then we'll rotate through a number of us as we go. I think Frank will be after me. Um, so we serve the lower shore, uh, the lower three counties. These numbers are a little bit old, but you can see we hold a fair number of easements, most, uh, most acreage in Worcester County, second most in Wicomico, and then third most in Somerset. Um, although now we tend to work a lot more in Wicomico and Somerset because Worcester does a lot of their purchased easements by themselves. Uh, we'll be used to um, a lot of those easements with them. Um, <clears throat> we have 135 easements currently on almost 24,000 acres. Um, that's all remains in private ownership uh, and is managed by the landowners, but we hold the restrictions over that property to keep them open. Um, and you can see the breakdown of that acreage. I think that's also a little bit old, those numbers, maybe two years ago. Um, but by far, in keeping with the landscape around us, most of it is forested. The second most is actually wildlife habitat and marsh, and the third most is agriculture. Um, throughout Maryland, those numbers would be you know, different depending on where you are, but here we're a heavily forested and marshed area, as most people probably know. <laughs> it's hard to get from one side of the county to the other without you know, running into <laughs> some water. So conservation easement, um, the basis of the organization and what we do, is a legal agreement, um, and it takes the form of a deed of conservation easement. It is recorded in the land records, and it's agreement between the landowner and a conservation organization or governmental entity. Um, we fall under the private nonprofit, um, and uh, our mission, our funding, everything is set up to be able to do conservation easements, um, and actually the IRS for donated easements actually has rules governing us of what we have to do and what we have to show them that we can actually take these things confidently and, and uh, steward them as well. Um, because we are promising the federal government and the IRS that we're gonna take care of these things until we need to do it. Um, who's involved? Uh, there's grantors and there's grantees. We're the grantee, uh, along with a bunch of our partners. Um, and then the grantor is the landowner. Uh, could be anything from an individual to a corporation to family partnership. Um, and it could be multiple people, um, but what we can't do is do different parcels that are owned by different people under the same easement. Um, that has been done before, we learned quickly that that is a bad thing to do. Um, so, they're forever. Um, a lot of people always ask us, can we buy these things out? In Maryland, almost every easement program, uh, well, every easement program now is permanent. There used to be some term easement programs, but those have all since uh, ceased to exist, um, uh, most notably is some old Maryland Ag Land Preservation Foundation of the Ag Easements uh, that were termed 25 years, but the state was really realized that they're just throwing money away.
for 25 years when most people weren't going to build for 25 years anyway, and then they still end up building and we're out however many hundreds of thousands of dollars for that protection. Um, as I said before, these are all privately held lands. They keep your ownership. You can still do a whole lot of things. The, the standard idea that we use to describe this relationship is normally when you have ownership of a piece of property, any piece of property, it's like you have a bundle of sticks or a bundle of pencils or something. Each pencil represents a different right, whether it's the right to farm, the right to timber, the right to build a house, the right to subdivide, the right to lease it, you know, all of those different things is a package that you have. What an easement does is takes away some of those sticks, so you don't have them anymore. And mostly that's the development potential and the ability to subdivide, the ability to put commercial or industrial type uh, developments on the property. But you can still do all of the other things, you can still pass it on, um, and you can still encumber it in other ways after the easement's done. So, uh, if you need to take a mortgage out, you still can, but it'll probably be based on a lower value because the easement's on it. Um, and, of course, it limits the use of the property. Conservation attributes, as Kate says, we, we protect these things for the conservation values. Um, a lot of people think we're anti-development. We're not really anti-development. We're anti-development in the wrong place. Um, and if we see that there's a, a value on the property, whether it's agriculture, whether it's a scenic, you know, most of the people live here or move here because it's beautiful. And so that's a public good to keep it beautiful, right? So we look at the attributes that the property has and we try to design that conservation easement to protect those things. And one of the ways to do that is to remove the development potential because it takes away that pressure on those values. Um, and so you can see a whole list of different things that we look at to see whether a property is a priority for conservation. We'd love to preserve them all, but we can't. Um, and so we have to come up with different criteria uh, to organize what's out there. And it's not like one's better than the other, um, but it takes me as long and as many resources to do a 15 acre easement as a 1500 acre easement. And so bang for the buck, we wanna do something a little bit bigger uh, that removes more development potential and protects more at the same time, uh, if possible. But we won't turn away the 15 acres, especially if it's really, really high quality, or it's surrounded by a bunch of protected lands, has a rare threatened endangered species on it, something like that. So we're always looking and evaluating each property that comes across uh, the threshold here. Um, this is the general terms of an easement, right? So we're restricting the activities, and the first thing to go is industrial and commercial, because those are the ones that are going to affect the property the most, right? When you put a Walmart on a piece of property or a Quickie Mart or, you know, tractor supply or whatever, it's a lot of impervious surface. It's a lot of people coming to the property. And those things all detract from the ability to protect those values as they are. Um, you have more runoff and all those things. So we get rid of that first. The next thing to go is the subdivision and the number of residents, really. These aren't in great order. But, um, and again, it's the same thing. It's the more times you subdivide it, the harder it is to manage it, and the more likely it is to damage those values that we're trying to protect. Well, for some of the things we're trying to keep are agriculture and working land. So timber harvesting is allowed on our properties, <laughs> um, uh, a number of other things. And then again, um, perpetuity. It's always in, in perpetuity forever. And we, we kind of like to joke that forever is a long time. We're just not sure how long that is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the types of conservation easements are two big buckets, right? There's regulatory. I did something wrong, and now the government's making me do something. Uh, and oftentimes, if you have a big property and you violate a wetland law or something, they might make you put a conservation easement on your property to protect it and have somebody else looking over your shoulder all the time because they think you did something bad and might do it again. Um, and so we take these, but these are by far the lower end of the spectrum for us because they're more likely to be violated. They're, more, they're much more difficult to manage and steward. Um, so we charge more for them <laughs> uh, because it's a lot more of our time, his time especially. Um, and, uh, but we do do a number of mitigation easements which are slightly different. If somebody else wants to build somewhere or fill a marsh for a project, then they might have to do an easement over somewhere else to protect or to build a marsh somewhere, and then we'll hold that easement to make sure that it stays that way. Most of what we do are voluntary easements. We work with people, they come to us, we outreach to them, 
they come in and we try to figure out what's the best thing for their property. It might not be an easement at all. I mean, we're not salespeople. We want to make sure that, you know, if you have a permanent relationship with somebody, you, you don't want to start off on the wrong foot by getting them something that they don't want or can't use uh, or is going to be problematic for them. An easement's not for everybody. But usually you can find something that works, whether it's an easement or some type of restoration or another program that helps protect those things that they're uh, find valuable or want to, you know, want to have on their property. Um, but it might not be a permanent easement if that's the best fit. But um, so they fall out as donated you know, for tax breaks of some sort. You purchase them for cash, or you can do kind of a hybrid where you sell it for say 50% of its value, and you can take a tax break on 50% and get cash. So uh, depending on how you want to use things or um, how you might be able to use things, there's different options for you. Um, there's a whole slew of different purchase easement programs. This is where, where my brain gets cluttered. Uh, each one of these is different. Each one has different criteria. Each one has a different focus. For instance, the Navy Recce program is great. Ready, uh, that's the Readiness and Environmental Protection Initiative. <laughs> and that basically buffers bases so they can continue to operate under their mission. Right? So if it's Aberdeen, up on the head of the bay, and I'm not sure if I, I grew up next to it, it's very loud because they test ordinance there. <laughs> you know, So they don't want people laid up against the base, um, and they don't, it, it's actually louder on the eastern shore than it is on the western shore right next to the base because of the way air moves. So they're buying easements up there to protect their mission, to make sure that there's fewer people there that are affected by it. We have the PAX uh, Naval Air Station, and we're under their flight pad, um, not right here, but uh, actually in Wicomico in the western hand of Somerset. And so they give us money to purchase easements there to lower the problems of their <coughs> high-flying loud aircraft, their helicopter areas and things like that. And so we try to line up the property, what's on the property with the right partners and what they're trying to protect. Um, I just wanna say before we get into this, when we go into protecting an easement, as Kate mentioned, there's a baseline documentation. <laughs> so I do all of this work. Frank doesn't do any of this work, right? He might go out with me to meet the landowner, uh, check out the property, but he hasn't gone through the process, what the easement is, what the property exactly looked like. Uh, and if Frank's not here, what happens 10 years from now when we go out? We need to know what the property originally looked like. So we take this thing called a baseline that's required with all easements that gives you the condition of the property and the conservation values that you're protecting on it. And that's sort of the guideline for what our goals are with that property. So that baseline is exceptionally important and he can go back for any property and look at what that corner looked like or what that pond looked like or was the buffer 100 feet at the time and now it's 50 feet. So all of that stuff is really important. If we don't have that information starting out, makes this job really hard. And so those 32 easements that we had to upgrade our baseline from uh, our predecessors, um, it, it, it was tough because it was hard to monitor those easements to know what was supposed to be there, what was there, and how is that different now. Um, so now we've updated all of those. So at least we know from now going forward what that, the full uh, scope of that property. Now I'm gonna uh, hand it over to Frank here like I do my normal projects, and he'll tell you about the, the actual reason that you're here. <laughs> Jared, you are an angel. Uh, like Jared said, I'm Frank Dieter. I am the stewardship uh, coordinator, and uh, I'm your contact for the uh, stewardship and going up on the property, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, if you don't have my email already, I think I emailed everybody yesterday too. Uh, just give me an email, or I give you all my cell number. Just get up with me and get out there, uh, have some fun. Uh, today I want to talk about what we're doing out there, uh, some of the procedures we're going through, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so the stewardship. Uh, so one of the main, main things we're doing out there is monitoring the properties. Uh, we're going out there, uh, not only are we having a little bit of fun looking at the birds and looking at the pretty scenery, uh, but we're also looking for uh, specific conservation values, uh, such as buffers, uh, 
any structures on the property, that sort of thing. I'll go, I'll go through that a little bit later. Uh, we're also going out there to talk to landowners, get to know them, what we can do to help them. Uh, like all this stuff here, I'll be going through a little bit more in depth. Um, and then for your requests and that sort of thing, that is more on my end. Um, but that's what we do all that LSLT. Try to work the land in or try to try to make everything simple and processing pretty easily. Uh, monitoring. So this is the main thing that we're going out there for. We're going out there either on the ground, uh, we can do remote monitoring or windshield slash well uh, just from back of the window type thing going on. Uh, on the ground is what we'll be doing a lot of the time. Uh, walking around the properties, uh, try to get to a corner, try to get somewhere we haven't been in a few years. Uh, that can be a little bit fun sometimes, especially if you have a ditch there. <laughs> um, but it's always a little something to look at. Um, remote monitoring, this is what uh, Lori and Britt did a few with me this, uh, this past year. Uh, and we've gone out there and basically look on laptops and uh, we use a company called Lens and uh, they take a silent image and we look at it and see what exactly is going on in the property, uh, any forestry going on, uh, any new structures. Uh, if we see something, we go on the ground and take a look. Uh, windshield, it's called drive-by basically. Uh, we go out there and we have to have a minimum of six photos and see if, hey, if there's nothing going on, it's a giant ag field, take a couple of gear from this window, a couple of that window, keep on going. Uh, Landowner relations, this is a, a critical part of what we do. Uh, we want to make, make sure our landowners know exactly what's going on and I uh, want to make good relations with them. Uh, so, like the statement says, uh, if a landowner feels good about uh, the land trust, they're going to come out there, they're going to talk to us. They're going to want to show us every little bit into the, uh, their property. They want to tell us about their tractors, 50 years old, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, but it's, it's really good to go out there and talk to the landowners, uh, get to know them, maybe invite them to the office, check it out, that sort of thing. Uh, so landowner relations, uh, so when we have a new landowner, uh, we try to make a first visit with them, make contact with them, especially with me. Uh, sometimes I'll bring Gary with me, uh, especially if we have an incident uh, like we did last week. So we'll do again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we go out there, say hello, um, say hello to the landowner, go over the terms and conditions of the easement, uh, what they can do, what they can't do, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, we also go over to annual monitoring visits, uh, to tell them that we're going to be out there every year or we do satellite imagery, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we always give them a notification <laughs> two weeks or so before we go out there and then uh, make a follow-up uh, phone call before we come out. Uh, newsletters, uh, that is like Kate's and Casey's department and they send out newsletters to landowners and tell them what's going on at LSLT and we're having educational workshops like today. So I'm biting into that, that sort of thing. Uh, so when we're out there, uh, some of the things we want to talk about with landowners is like if they have plans for construction, uh, are they planning to uh, or thinking about subdividing the property, which is a lot of times not allowed. So we have to uh, talk to them about that. Uh, make sure if they do that, we have to come into the office or give us a phone call or email before we do do anything like that. Uh, construction property expansion of residence. Uh, just talk to them. Make uh, just say, hey, uh, we need just contact Dallas LT before coming out or doing that project. Uh, all this really is applies to that. Timber harvest, uh, I'll go do that a little bit later. Uh, or if even if they know anybody has an interest in an easement, like we had a planner a couple weeks ago call and the neighbor uh, had a had an interest in an easement, so it worked out pretty well. Uh, uh, successful land landowner. So this is the uh, the big thing we have to keep an eye on is when we have a new landowner, uh, a lot of these, sometimes these landowners don't know that they actually have an easement. 
Uh, so we gotta keep tabs on that. Uh, what I'll do is before we go out there, mm -hmm. I'll check on the state database and see exactly who owns that property. If there's a new owner and we'll try to contact them all that. Uh, but uh, but there is a, some research that says that those violations happen for af after uh, the first conservation easement. So, uh, so someone bought property, uh, and that's where violations tend to happen. Uh, mainly that's because of uh, that the landowner, the new landowner, doesn't know exactly what happened, or they don't, like, we didn't put the conservation easement, why do we have to file that sort of thing. So we have to sit down, explain it to them, that sort of thing. Uh, strategic uh, stewardship. So uh, this is mainly talking to uh, or getting the know the landowners a little more. Uh, but if we see something out there, such as uh, they have a wet spot in the middle of the field, uh, I think Beth is going to talk about, about that a little later. Uh, but we talk to them about maybe DMP installations or uh, if we have a, a wetland installation, we talk to them about land or education, come to our workshops, uh, bring them to the office, we can talk to them a little fun. Are you going to cover that wood chip thing right here? Uh, I actually don't know too much about that. Yeah, so. no, it's a really a growing um, area for uh, water quality benefits. So um, one of our partners across the bridge in Howard County is doing a whole lot with bio, um, biochip, bioreactor. Um, so potentially we'll see a lot more of it <coughs> on the shore. We might do another like, yeah, out, like workshop on it. Real quick, they, uh, <laughs> it's basically the standard one takes a ditch and redirects the water out of it into a, a dug ditch that's filled with wood chips. Um, and the water flows through that and it rem the wood chips help remove the nutrients and some of the sediment from the flow and then it goes back into the creek. So you can measure the water quality going into the bioreactor and then coming out. Um, they have a fairly long life um, and work really well. The problem with here <laughs> is we don't have a lot of slope and these things need to have water constantly running through. So not all of our land is sort of qualifies for these because there's not enough slope, but there are a lot of opportunities to do this here. Uh, and it can be, uh, they're, they're also very helpful in uh, animal operations, especially dairy operations where you have lagoons and things like that, where it's helpful to have extra nutrient removal. So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing and not that expensive. How often do they need to change out the chips? Uh, they, they, they were thinking that the lifetime would be about 20 years, but most of them have gone way beyond 20 years. Um, they're still fully effective, or at least over 80% effective at removing nutrients. So it basically is like as long as the carbon is still there and available to grab things, then it's, it's okay. So I guess it depends on the depth and like how much bulk of wood is actually in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when we're going out there, uh, there are some things that we need to bring. Uh, bug spray, I don't usually use that personally, uh, but a lot of people will, especially down down in Crisfield when there's mosquitoes everywhere. Uh, sunscreen, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing always to have it on you. Uh, water bottles, snacks, uh, as you all know, for past steward, I usually keep granola bars in the truck, so we have to break them open, that's all good. <laughs> uh, perfect clothing, uh, wear warm clothes, if it's going to be 20 degrees out there, hopefully it's not, but uh, make sure you have a couple of jackets or whatever. Uh, long pants are a must, They're, we're going through forest and area, make sure you have long pants where the ticks won't get you. Uh, also recommend taking your sock and put it over your, uh, under your pants where they won't start climbing up your legs. Uh, close to your shoes, uh, I highly recommend boots are waterproof. Uh, maybe go up close to your knee. Uh, that way, if we go find a ditch somewhere, we can get through that no problem. Or we find a wet spot in the field, and we don't want to get through deep uh, wet. Uh, bring a rain jacket if you need to. If it's going to be drizzling, bring that along. And a hat, of course. Uh, so, this is just a little bit of overview for the next section. Uh, what, what we're going to uh, what we're looking for, so there's land use structures, uh, buffers, trash piles, that sort of thing.
Uh, land use. So uh, when you're doing your when we're doing the reporting, uh, it's broken down in four sections. So land use, you got your uh, buffer zone, you got your structures, and you got your overall impression. So that's the overall thing. So all this stuff I'm about to cover is what you see in the report area. So land use. Uh, so what the property is used for. Uh, is there any tax uh, tax ditches, uh, any streams, that sort of thing? So if the property is used for ag, write that mm -hmm. down. If it's used for forestry, is it used for? Uh, it's got homestead and it'll just make a note of that. What's going on on the property? Uh, that sort of thing. If there's any streams, such as uh, Tony's Creek, the road we were looking at the other day, <laughs> uh, write that down. Uh, any tax ditches or. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of channels on the property. You can write that down, it'd be cool. That, that way we know exactly what's going on on the property, what, what, what we need to look for for the next following years, or if it's something changed in the past, we can look that up as well. Uh, structures, um, so we're, when we're out there, we're also looking for structures. Uh, is there any new structures, any structures that's deteriorating, uh, what the structures are being used for? So we look at this one here, uh, that's a house and it's pretty bad shape. Uh, so I'm just write that down. Residential structure looks looks to be uh, uh, falling in, uh, not being used, something like that on the report. Uh, for agriculture, uh, we're looking for barns, looking for sheds, silos, uh, chicken houses. Uh, there's one of the questions I got on there is a chicken house and what it's used for. So like example this, he's using it as a forest cow barn. So he's not using it for chickens anymore. So I just take a note of that. Uh, if there are any other structures, like you see a, a pump house in the middle of the field, just take a note of that real quick. Uh, that way we know it's there and no one freaks out to go out there and see a big building. Uh, buffers. So this is one of the issues that we usually end up having. Is uh, going out to the property and we see a buffer area that's kind of short. Uh, so like this one here, you can see where it used to be, but this is supposed to be trees. So, uh, yeah. Uh, There's one tree through there. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, so buffers uh, slow down sediment, it also helps reduce runoff. So they're very critical for uh, conservation purposes. It also provides habitat for uh, animals such as quail and deer, uh, which farmers love. Um, but um, not all properties contain a buffer. Yeah. There's, I would say about half of them do, especially the older properties <laughs> and the donated. Um, so just keep an eye on that. So when we're going through there, uh, I'm working on, right now, you have to look at the easement itself. I'm working on right now, making that profile sheet. That way you can look on there and say, hey, this buffer's supposed to be here or this structure's supposed to be here. So it'll make it easy for everybody and myself included. Uh, so, and so when we're measuring the buffer area, uh, so when we go out in our training session, uh, you guys last year knew I used a cup and a, uh, a cup and a little measuring stick like thing and we try to measure out how many like feet. So we measure out 50 foot or 100 foot and try to get it right. Uh, it's a really cool activity. So we'll do that again this year. Uh, I think one of the days when you do it goes like 50 degrees and Wendy, <laughs> or we're going on that day. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll make sure to do that this year for that group. Um, we're, out, we're out there looking for changes. So if we're going out there and we say, hey, there's a buffer here, and it looks like it's been cut back, uh, they can do that. Or if you see, like, uh, there's supposed to be like a forested area, and it's 200 foot, supposed to be 100 foot, now it's 100 foot again, they can do that. So. That way we know it's exactly what's going on. And uh, if we have any questions about it, we can look on like aerial imagery, silent imagery, take a look what's going on there as well. Uh, trash and debris. Uh, again, we're looking for changes. So uh, this is easily exemplified by the images itself. So if you see something like that in the woods, it's old. This, you need to take a picture of it, take a picture. Don't really have to. We know it's there. You, you have a picture of someone's property. Uh, if you see something like this on the property, you might need to take a note of that and we get back to the office, talk it over, and 
uh, you say to the landlord, hey, you need, to, you need to pick this up or whatever. Uh, but we're looking there, we're looking for unnatural materials. Uh, so like plastic bottles, stuff like this, uh, mainly new degree cars. You go out there and you see a pile of uh, like uh, two by fours or something and it looks pretty old. I usually just walk by it and just don't need to look too bad. Uh, but it's, that's more of a natural, especially if it's not treated. But if it's like something like this or yeah, just take a picture real quick, keep on going. Well, there's a difference between kind of the old farm historical yeah. dumps, which are generally yeah. something that's mostly glass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an old car, as long as it doesn't have, you know, anything leaking into the, to the uh, groundwater. Those yep. are historical and, and may or may not have been discovered when the easement was in place. They're often buried in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, depending on the time of year you go out, you might discover these things. Yeah. But intentional dumping, like you see in the bottom picture, that's not allowed on the easements. <laughs> but, but just to, as a note, um, that isn't allowed on the easement, but there's a good reason. So we take a picture of it, and then we go back, figure out what's going on here, and that might just be a call to the landowner. And we found out that they're actually cleaning stuff yeah. up here. Yeah. And yeah. This is a pile that they're creating of the stuff that they're cleaning up. And so it's a temporary place before they take it to the dump. Yeah. So we're not, you're going out like trying to beat somebody over the head, like you can't have that there, you know, we just want to know what's going on and then work with them yep. to, to, to make sure that everything is, is copacetic yeah. with the, yeah, believe, in terms of the easement. I believe so. they were renovating their house or something. Yep. They were making a pile on that. So it was a, it was a big deal. So. Before it gets out of hand. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, forestry, uh, like we were saying before, and Jerry said before, um, a lot of these uh, properties are a lot of forest, uh, as long as they have a forest structure plan or if they, if they have to have one, uh, depending on the property, it's okay. Uh, if you see a forestry practice in place, take a picture, especially if you see stuff like this going on. Just take a quick picture of it and bring it back to the office or take a look at it, see what's going on. If you have to look at the arrow interview, take it real quick. Uh, one of the things we're also looking for is making sure the forest stewardship plan is up to date. Uh, I've been usually doing that, but hopefully we monitors going forward and take a look at that as well. Uh, so get that going through too. Uh, erosion and soil water quality plans. Uh, so soil water quality plan is mainly for the ag fields and uh, basically is a plan, uh, basically a contract between farmer and the uh, like NRCS to make sure they are uh, using uh, nutrients appropriately. Is that correct? Or something like that? No, that's the nutrient management plan. The soil and water quality plan yeah. is a little odd. Um, if you, most Maryland farmers actually have it. You have to have one to partake in any of the cost share programs, but it's, it's, you, it's it's actually with the Soil Conservation District, and they'll come and look at the property and give you areas for improvement that are all voluntary. So they'll say, well, maybe you can put some tile drains in here, and it'll help drain the field here, or maybe you need some downspouts on your barn because you're causing erosion. They'll write all that up into a voluntary plan. Some of our easements require that you actually activate those things, uh, so we wanna make sure that the plan's reasonable and not just throwing out random things to make the landowner <laughs> believe money. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, yeah. It, it's looking for these issues like erosion that could be fixed through some type of best management practice. Yeah. And then they'll give you a prescription of what to do mm -hmm. if you want to deal with it. Yeah. So, yeah. And it also, I mean, it does help with nutrient, yeah. you know, this, yeah, yeah, retention on the property or, dis, you know, dispersal off the property mm -hmm. and keeping that you know, yeah. to a minimum. Um, but yeah, all that, and uh, <laughs> uh, our, and then we're also looking for uh, erosion. That's one of the questions on the, um, uh, the report. And uh, if we if you see something like this or IRB, because this is kind of a cool picture, mm -hmm. uh, take a picture of it. So this is a, a war shop going to a drainage ditch in the field. Take a picture of it. Uh, a lot of times, it's nothing really to worry about. But uh, at least take a picture, make sure, um, I'll take a look at, it, show it to Jerry, Kate, or we'll go through that. And then and there also could be some things that we would hand off to that and see yeah. if there's 
things that we have programs available or whatever that can help them with that. Um, so there's, you know, try to keep the out-of-pocket cost for the farmers lower um, by trying to find di different programs to deal with issues like this. Yeah, uh, and that's an example of uh, land loss due to pursue a low rise and erosion. So it's kind of cool to see that as you're going through the properties. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so this is the one of the main points. Uh, it's a second one coming up here soon. But we're out there uh, to observe changes. So if you don't remember anything from this presentation, except for this point, the next one, we're out there to observe changes. So uh, basic ground monitoring procedures. Uh, so we're always going out there in groups of two or more. Uh, that's mainly for safety. Uh, we're orange vests, we're something bright colored. That way people can see you, or if you have a hunter on the next pure property, you know exactly what's going on there. Uh, I have car signs. Uh, I usually put one on the windshield and then one on the uh, driver's side window. That way people go up to the property or like, oh yeah, you're, you're out there monitoring. Uh, that way I don't ride around in four wheeler trying to find you. Uh, uh, so we're also making a, uh, a point map. So when you're out there taking photos, or we're, we're also integrating landscape, which does that for you now. Uh, so you're out there, you know, take, the landscape will take the GPS coordinate and the direction you're going in. Makes life a lot easier <laughs> going in the past. Uh, it also takes uh, time and uh, your Time, date, and a monitor is present, which is also great. Uh, we're out there, we need to have a minimum of six photos, uh, which is pretty easy to do, especially when you get in these three, 400 acre properties and you can be there half a day. So some of them are real pretty. Um, if you're out there, talk to the landowner if you can. Uh, if you can't, it's okay, just make a note the landowner was available. Um, have a little fun, see some birds, of course. Uh, and time in, time out, and like I said, landscape does that for you. So it makes it a lot easier for everybody. Just a, a note about watch the birds. Um, <coughs> not just birds. But we are trying to find if there's anything interesting out there. So if you, you know, if you have a specialty, um, like ferns or you know, birds or insects or something, we want to know what we're seeing. Uh, if you can get a photo of it, it's awesome. We love to have those kind of cover photos that aren't really monitoring photos, but they're those things that we can capture while we're out there uh, and indicate maybe the conservation is doing some good. Uh, and we are seeing these things on these farms. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and always note it, tree species, whatever you see out there is good to note in the uh, notes section uh, because the landowners really appreciate, especially that mm -hmm. when you send the follow-up letter and say, we saw great fox or we saw a bald eagle or something they really like that um, most people would right so uh, you know keeping track of that's just as important as keeping track of the you know the buffers yeah. and, and the buildings yeah. and stuff like that there so. is there is a question on the report that says uh, uh, something like it said did you see any cool species or yeah. animals did or you see anything areas? cool or whatever yeah, yeah I can't remember what I put on there but, but yeah be mindful <laughs> uh, but my reports um, so they do look a little different this year. Uh, this is landscape. Uh, if you guys haven't seen uh, seen it yet, uh, this is like a game changer for us. Uh, Lori, Lori uh, Kathleen. Kathleen, we really helped with it last year, getting it going. Uh, someone else, I know Becky has, uh, but it was really big help trying to get going. Uh, basically, we spent a lot of hours in trying to put all our properties and all our visits into a one software database. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time trying to code that. Uh, that was not fun. Uh, but basically, all you gotta do is click a button on the landscape, and it spits out all that information about the property. And then you also, it's a questionnaire format. So when you're in a property, then you answer the questions as you go, which is really cool. And this is a little test run that Kate and I did uh, back in December. And you can see, you can take a photo there. So you get two photos there. I can't remember if it is. You can click on it, it shows you where it is. And it tracks you where you walk. So how many miles and that sort of thing, which is really, really cool. And so 
we go out there and say, hey, we haven't been to this side of the property in a couple of years, mm -hmm. and nobody can get that side of the property. So it's a really, it's a big game changer here. Mm -hmm. It's not insignificant in the cost. And <laughs> Frank had to beg me a little bit for it, but you see how happy he is. Um, He's our little gearhead, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> it also deals with the seven or eight spreadsheet problem that we had. Yeah. Um, Fitting seven spreadsheets is kind of a, can be a waste of time, and so this really saves us a lot of yeah. time. Um, also, it like tracks it tracks volunteers, it tracks the landowner. So all you gotta do is a search bar up here. Say we need to find Mary, this type of Mary, and comes up her name. She's got her email, phone number, that sort of thing. And how many hours probably she's done this year? <laughs> yeah, and it tells you that too. How many hours you out there, and if you have any mileage reported, that sort of thing. You can pop it all up in a couple of seconds. It's just really great. So you don't walk the entire easement? Uh, not every time. Not every time. Um, exactly. We try to, you know, generally, some easements you can't. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons we do our remote monitoring now as much as possible, um, because I'll, like the one of my slides, there's all that marsh and swamp and stuff. We can't get into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So having the remote ability, um, but, you know, you don't have to. Once you know these properties well enough, you know where the weak points are, if you will, um, and you go and check those. So if you get to that other side of the road, which we know there's nothing on, once every two or three years, that's enough to know if there's changes um, over there. But you know, we go out every year, so we sort of learn where the big problem areas are, and you want to make sure you definitely hit those. And then you hit parts of it. So you don't have to get to all four corners of the property every year. But over time, you want to get to all four corners of the property. And, and, you, don't, and you don't do any drone roads or anything? Not, not yet. Our, our, uh, yes, I'll see those. The partners to yeah. the north uh, have. The problem is, it's a great tool to see a lot sure. and to get you know, a lot of information really quickly. But then you have to go back and review it and you know, go through your footage, and it takes more time actually to monitor with a drone than it actually takes on the ground. Yeah. And then for <laughs> like the analysis of that footage takes forever. So like yeah. side of imagery for every property, we get a high res, like maybe once a month or so at each property, except for what's on the Cook County area that's for some reason. Not that's, figured out. Nobody wants to fly over that. But no one wants to fly over Western Wakamaco. But um, I think that's because it's the Navy flight. Yeah, I think so too. But, <laughs> Shut um, down. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but we get uh, low res. So low res is free, and they're they're flying that. I would say about once a week. In a whole ocean shore, you'll get a, like a ten meter, ten meter uh, image. So yeah, we got to see if like forestries happen, but it's yeah. really hard to see if they enlarge the house or yeah. if there's a new shed. So yeah, just I mean, if you go out and you guys see something like, oh, this forest is gone, I can go in there real quick and see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And when the exact about what the, the forest is. So it's really cool. Uh, what to expect when we're out there? Uh, uh, go through this a couple times, but we're going out there walking, hiking long distances. Uh, there will be ditches, so uh, I think uh, I think we Mary and Kathy found out more that one last year with Mike. Yeah, the rough terrain <laughs> here is, is mainly like corn stubble, but yeah, um, but, you know, if you if you hit a little swampy spot, that's yeah. kind of rough too. So. Yeah, um, and there's uh, one property I did lose a boot on, so I'll <laughs> yeah. uh, give you give you a heads up about that one. Uh, there is places of rough terrain. Uh, especially you get to you know, uh, Wakamako or you get to Somerset where it's a little bit swampy. Um, or low ground, but there also is beautiful landscapes, there's wildlife, uh, thing, me and Tracy saw a beautiful black span. It was oh, really so amazing. It was a beautiful black span. And then uh, friendly, lo uh, friendly loving landowners, can't forget them. Uh, Most of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so also programs that we're looking for. So LCLT has a lot of different programs. Uh, quill habitat, uh, pollinator garden tour, see a property uh, like a thing. I mean, we already saw a property last year. We need to have this sometime. Uh, pollinator garden tour, uh, pollinator habitat uh, places, uh, forest tree planting, uh, 
any soil health issues. I'll go through that a little bit later too. Wetlands and impoundments, uh, that should probably go through that a little bit. And other opportunities for restoration or conservation of the property. And this, just a note on this, this is, this is to look for that's on the ground or opportunities that they could have it on the ground if they wanted it. Um, so you're looking to see if they do have quail habitat, but you're also looking potentially, this could be good quail habitat, and we can get them information if, if they need to follow up with it. Or if you're looking at satellite imagery and you see a spot that's year after year the same part of the field is wet. Yeah, it might be a good, as well. good place for a wet, wet meadow or a wetland or something like that. So. And what happens after ground visit? So uh, download images, that's very important. Download them on. Uh, we can do that off landscape or we can do it off the camera, whatever is easier. Uh, so if you're going out there and you're using a phone on landscape, I can go in here, hit the download, hit download all, and put them right on uh, compressed file. It's pretty easy. Uh, right up monitoring uh, reports, uh, no old times, get all, everything is a little complicated sometimes, but like I said, landscape spits that all right out. But it's really fun. and. Uh, send out letters and landowners, follow up letters. Uh, we have to have that in within three months. That letter and report has to be done within three months of going out there. So uh, usually we get it done in two, three weeks. So, yep. Uh, and then we come in here, and if you see something, let me know, let Jerry know, let Kate know, one of us know, see something, we evaluate it, see what's going on, that sort of thing. So, this is point number two. Uh, we're out there to observe, we're not out there to evaluate. We'll do evaluation in the office itself. So, uh, yeah, I just, I'll say this multiple times when we're out there. So, um, any questions before we go to bed? What about fences? Uh, that's an easement. So, fences, I would say about 90% of the time. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, so. Normal things that you would expect on a property to be on a property. Um, there's actually a sentence, a, a whole clause that talks about fencing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's mainly what we don't want to see if there's, for instance, there's a um, scenic conservation value from the road. What they can't do is build a stockade fence to block your view of the property, hence there is no scenic view anymore. Um, so there are certain things that you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> And some things you can't really do much about. Somebody plants a Leland cypress hedge or something like that. Uh, they plant a Leland cypress hedge, but um, it's it's perfectly fine. But what we probably don't do, um, in fact, I don't, I haven't done it at all with this group. But in Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, they have a little bit more uh, animal husbandry up there, so you do have to cross a fence or two. But we're not climbing fences. No. <laughs> uh, a lot of times I walk around. Yeah. Or and a lot of these uh, farms, they actually have lanes to go around fence. So, which is nice for the for the access. Those are the ones we like the most, where the boundary actually has you know a, a, a path or you know access around it, so we know exactly what the boundary is, and it's easy to access the whole thing. Most of our properties sadly don't have that. <laughs> I just want to reiterate that last slide: to observe and not evaluate. So you know. All of our volunteer land stewards are out there representing the Lower Shore Land Trust. Um, and when you're going out there, you know, you don't want to get into, even if it seems to be a, seems to be an apparent violation or you're concerned about a buffer, it's not what our land stewards are out there for. As staff people, we won't even bring it up at that time. You know, we want to make sure, you know, we're just out there to observe um, have a good time, have it, you know, be able to just take the information back to the office and then review it and then make sure, oh, well, that was allowed or that is part of the practice. So there's a lot of times that, that things are, may seem, may not seem to be appropriate. And forestry was one of those big things early on that many of us had to figure out that, that the forestry industry has best practices that may not look pretty, but they're perfectly fine and they're actually following the guidelines. So we did a lot early on in terms of educating our staff and our board and our volunteers about forestry practices. Hi, I'm Beth. Um, I just had a couple slides to add because that was Jerry and he frankly doesn't make it up. But I, um, 
I was hired in as an agricultural outreach specialist, so that was sort of a new position within the land trust, um, trying to, to kind of be able to expand on the ideas of what, what we can do with properties that are within um, maybe easements or even beyond. So, um, so we definitely work with other partners. Um, I am working mainly with um, Washington College as a biologist named Dan Small. And uh, that's the Center for Environmental. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of Center for Yeah, Center for Environmental Society. So that's it called the National Lands Project, and that's one of the main um, go tos we've had for trying to look for new quail habitat. And specifically, I just get to do that for agricultural land. So it has to be in crop rotation, it has to have been in crop rotation within the last two years. So when we um, come across other property owners who might want to put in a pollinator meadow, but they don't have it in ag, there are other options, but it's just not within the grant funded um, programming for cost share. We have to kind of come up with other options, but um, that's, that's mainly what we're, what we're trying to do. We're just trying to help connect landowners <coughs> and farm operators with, with what could be possible. As he was saying, if we come across um, hydric soils, we want to be able to help. Um, and so number one, just like what Frank's saying, number one way to be able to help is to be able to walk the land. So to be able to do that, you need to have voluntary interaction where a landowner wants you out to there and um, has a motivation of their own of, of wanting to, they, they either read about something they have, um, have put in an article or they just been educating themselves on the benefit of having more um, pollinator meadows. Um, right now, it's, um, and you know, or maybe it's the, the realizing, again, on their land, they realize that they have more and more uh, Phragmites, which are number of a huge problem for all of our low-lying areas, even if it's um, non-tidal, they're getting infiltrated to that in their farm fields, and what are some other things they can do to that? And so just maybe coming up with other um, kinds of plantings that would help, or just management of like getting rid of the frag as best they can so they can then try another type of habitat. Um, so it really is about this synchronicity of, of helping them know that on the land they can, they can do, um, they can change some of the methods that maybe were old, old school for, for farming and try to use less herbicides and leave more space, especially now we're talking more about riparian buffers or just having other um, native species as buffer zones for, for quail. Um, so at the moment we have, um, we have two um, conservation, Chesapeake Conservation Corps staff and one a chose for her capstone to help with our quail project. So she has just this, like just a, within the last 10 days, we sent out these little postcards for surveys and we, and we were able to use the amazing lens. Thank you, Kate, for that. That was super <laughs> helpful to have the landscape, to have that way to use the database. And, um, and we also did a lot of work for the GIS maps, trying to see where people might have potential habitat for quail. And we've already gotten some positive feedback, so that's really exciting. People are, are responding to the survey that she has, like a Google survey. If I can just jump in, that survey was really easy to navigate from the postcards and go through to, because yeah. my mom got one and we went through it, and it was it was so, so awesome. simple. It was like our, it was great. like yeah. we were cheering. We're like, yay, yeah. it worked. Well, what, it we really hope, worked. what we hope to get from that survey when we identify these areas where there is there have been quail seen or heard is to focus some of our resources into um, strengthening the restoration work around that area so, so that we can increase that habitat yeah. so then we're able to go in and highlight and say the reason you have quail is it awesome and it's probably because you've left this buffer zone or you have this overgrown what you think of as overgrown ditch bank but it's actually providing some shelter or you're not just mowing, or your mowing practice is improved. It's amazing how just educating our, our farmers about the um, mowing practice, not mowing, and you know only you know only mowing at like April fifteenth, just one time, and then not again. And so, um, so, so April 1st, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just keeping it, keeping that 
the onset's not always about like taking out the golf course. <laughs> So yeah, that's a, a cool project that's going to strengthen what resources we have within um, the Orchard Land Trust because this map, the story map that she's going to make from the survey will be available on our website. And that will be a really cool feature to share. And, um, and then when we know, again, identifying with your soil to help in that's not um, beneficial for the for crop rotation then how can we help and so then we create like a little wetland guide because for most of our area i mean it could be either tidal or non-tidal but it's a non-tidal wet area we have some different programs that are available through um, the soil and water conservation nrcs has different options to help incentivize so this these are showing you the same the same area as the so this area here that you can see, a lot of times wet will look like that on the helix. Sometimes it'll be darker than that, um, but when you go out, you can actually see it on the ground and you can see the water that's ponding here. And so that would be an opportunity. It's actually round, it looks like an old Delmarva Bay, uh, which would be really interesting. And of course, the landowner doesn't have to do anything, but if we can tell them that there's an option there or an opportunity there, they might do that. So and. You know, that ain't gonna grow crops, so why waste the diesel and the, the nutrients and whatnot on a, on a, on a pond? <laughs> Turn and, it into something useful. And that's also the whole issue about if you need to, sometimes it's not all about being able to do remote monitoring. You need to walk the land because there's, a, you know, some of us have realized that it could look wet from an aerial view and then they get there and if they do the soil um, testing, it might not actually be, um, you know, a, a qualified to be a wetland. So another thing that we, um, you know, as I said sort of before, a lot of people know us for our native plant sale uh, and our pollinator garden tour and things like that. Um, but there's sort of the reverse side of it, right? That's all dealing with natives and what we believe should be on the landscape and what's going to be easier for you to tend in your gardens and it's going to need less input, less water, etc. But there's also this whole other side of vegetation and we're not asking you to be experts, but there are certain big problem species across the landscape. Um, and so we want to educate people on what the problem is, why we care about it, um, what's the difference between an invasive species and a noxious weed. There's some very important distinctions there. Um, and then uh, we have some guides online and then we can uh, send people uh, electronically um, that has a lot more than 10 species. Um, and then what they can do to, to stop the spread of it. Um, and so, uh, which is very important to keep a healthy environment. Um, invasive species have been called the silent tsunami uh, in that it, it just builds slowly and slowly and before you know it, it's crushing your house. Um, and uh, most people see that English ivy and so it's pretty ground cover and then the next thing they know their pine tree is in the backyard because it's been pulled down by that pretty ground cover. Um, so yeah, they don't know what's happening and, and a lot of us are not good with vegetation. I'm, I'm a, call myself a naturalist, I guess. I don't know a lot of this stuff and I've been studying plants and birds and bugs and whatever my whole life. Um, so we're not expecting people to be experts, but there's certain things that if you open your eyes just a little bit, you'll see how different those things are from what a native plant would do. Um, and yeah, some of the problems are they just take over. They'll crush things. They're a health or safety hazard, but they're also really, really hard on our natural environment. Um, they basically take something over because there's no natural predators. There's nothing to keep it in check. And then it just destroys everything else that's native around it. One of the biggest problems is, especially with our wildflowers, um, a lot of stuff will take over and then our native wildflowers that are ephemeral, usually come up early spring, can't. Uh, and they can't reproduce and then we lose whole swaths of species. And this is what it could look like. So this is the beautiful plant, wisteria. Everybody loves wisteria, right? It's pretty, it's got those nice draping blooms. But then it does this. And this is at Pemberton Historic Park. We had, well, we thought we had 14 acres. It was actually bigger than 14 acres. Um, and it appears 
We thought at first that it might be the neighboring um, development that maybe escaped over the boundary, but I started talking to some other people and there was a house site here from the 1800s, and it's more than likely that it's actually from that house site. Um, and again, silent tsunami, something that they planted long, long ago, finally had become a problem. Um, and uh, it could have something to do with climate change. We're not entirely sure, but some of these vines are exploding when they never did before. Um, Kudzu-like, if you will, if everybody's heard of the nightmare of kudzu down in the southeast. So, um, that's kudzu. <laughs> and you don't even know what's back there because it's just draped over everything and, and pulled everything in this, you know, nearby down. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, you know, we all loved it as kids, you know, sweet and nice, but it's not so sweet and nice. Um, and then, of course, bamboo. Um, and, and Kate just sent a nice article that a lot of the counties in Maryland uh, are asking for state help in dealing with bamboo. If you drive down 50 towards, uh, between here and Ocean, uh, Salisbury, or between Ocean City and Salisbury, there's a wall on the uh, west side of the road. Um, and it's basically, it will probably start coming up through the, the, the asphalt at some point. It's so strong, it'll push right through concrete and asphalt. And it's, it's crazy. Um, we also look for certain things. This is uh, uh, Japanese knotweed. Um, this is a terrible, <coughs> nasty plant in England. It's so bad, you, if you have it on your property, you can't sell your property. Um, and then, of course, everybody knows Craig Mites. Craig Mites is kind of hard. We actually have a native species of Craig Mites, if you didn't know it. I didn't, um, but I couldn't identify it for the life of me. Um, but it certainly doesn't do this. <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's some agricultural pests that are really bad. And these tend to get into what we call the noxious weeds, which was a slide before. But Palmer amaranth is the most recent species that's added to the noxious weed list. Um, and it is horrible. It's actually a native species, not even invasive. But it's native to the southwest, not here. Um, and it can, I think an individual female plant can have up to 250,000 seeds. Just one plant. Um, and then calorie pear. Everybody loves the Bradford pear, right? Not really. It's a terrible invasive, and, and states like North Carolina and Tennessee and whatever are banning it. You know, something that you normally wouldn't expect a southern state to do, <laughs> ban a piece of vegetation, but they're doing it because it's that much of a problem, and it really affects agricultural land. So noxious weeds are actually regulated by law. Right? If you have one of the noxious weeds that's on the list, you have to remove it from your property or you can be fined. Uh, I don't think they'll seize your property, but I think they could if they wanted to. Um, but things like Johnson grass, these are things that are so bad and cause so much damage to the agricultural community, basically, sometimes the, the forestry community, community, that they're bad, that you just cannot have them. If you find them, you have to treat them. Um, and as I said, the new, new one started at Palmer Amherst. Um, Maryland doesn't have a lot, but if it's on this list, it's bad. Um, and then invasive species is a little bit different. So there's two tiers. Uh, tier one is you can't sell it in Maryland. Um, and you can see a couple of the different, um, right, the yellow flag iris. Don't get it. We, we sell, we've got a beautiful blue one. So, you know, why do you need a yellow one? Um, right, some of these things are really nasty. Um, then there's tier two, which they can sell, but they have to put a warning on. I don't know why they can sell them, but that's the way it is. And of course, you can see Listeria is part of that. Mandina is a pretty nasty one that a lot of people love to have. Burning bush. Uh, Scotch broom, when I was out west, that, that's the worst invasive in like Washington, Western Washington. Um, but in invasive species, a lot of people um, think it's like a, a maple tree, for instance, is an invasive species. Well, an invasive is usually a non-native. So maple being native is not invasive. It has invasive characteristics. But that's because it's a primary or first succession species, right? It's trying to take advantage of the open ground, grows really fast, and then when everything else grows up around it, it dies off. Um, the noxious weeds of the true invasive species don't really die off. They just take it over, and that's what's there. Um, and so, you know, is it naturalized in Maryland? What's the distribution? We have some invasive species that they don't have in the Piedmont or the western areas, and so. It, there's different characteristics of the soil, the climate, whatever, that make something much more prone to invasiveness um, as a non-native than uh, in different areas. Um, so you have to know your area the best. So we've come up with an invasive species, species toolkit 
that helps you identify some of the things that are more common in our area, because you could look at the ones that Pennsylvania has or North Carolina has, but that's not really what is our true um, bad species. So we went through and talked to all the experts that we know in the area and tried to get their top 10 lists. And we built our toolkit from all of those people that are on the landscape all the time and seeing these problems. Um, and so you can find it on our website through um, the QR code. And these are some of the ones, I'm not gonna go through this, I'll just run through them real quick, but we all know Phragmites. Um, and if you could figure out how to identify it from the native, uh, we'll give you a, um, well, you can go on the golden clipboard, I'll, I'll put you there myself. <laughs> uh, and a Japanese knotweed, this is gonna be found if you drive down uh, and you look at the ditches that go into the Pokemok, or the tax ditches, this is the big problem along that, which is even worse because it breaks off. Any little piece of this plant that breaks off can root anywhere. So if it's on a waterway, gets broken off and taken down the waterway, it's gonna root, and then it's gonna root, and then it's gonna root, and it just takes over everything, and it's really hard to kill. You can spray it, it'll knock it back, and then it'll come up and shoot. It's, it's, it's nasty stuff. Um, Tree of Heaven. Um, should be called the tree of hell, I think. Yeah. There's nothing heavenly about this. It smells like rotten peanut butter. Um, it grows across, the, it was brought in for bank stabilization for road cuts, which was thought to be a really useful use, but then they didn't realize because it grew so well, it was gonna become invasive. Um, and, uh, and you can see it seeds heavily. So the worst invasives not only seed heavily, but they also vegetatively grow heavily. Right, so they're, they're, they're expanding from two methods and it's really hard to keep them at bay. Spud lanternfly. Oh, sorry, sorry, great, I forgot that that was on this one. Yeah, this guy, he's the new invasive. Most of what we deal with is plants, but there's a couple of bugs particularly that are bad. Um, spotted lanternfly is coming down here. I saw my first one, which is terrible, in Kent County, my home county, um, Kent County, Maryland, north on the shore of the Sasquatch Wildlife Management Area this fall. Um, there have been a couple of places. There was a breeding area outside of uh, Bivalve, I think it was. That, uh, that's the only breeding population they found down here. They eradicated it, but that doesn't mean they're gone. It will be back, and it is a terrible pest, particularly for grapes, uh, uh, black walnut, and its actual host tree is the tree of heaven. <laughs> but it didn't come in with its host tree. It came in on some rocks, I think, from China or something like that. Um, because it, it, it pastes its uh, egg sacs yeah. to something, and it, it's really gross looking, whatever, but any hard surface, yeah. so. Uh, they especially love the back of tires. Yep, so. tires, yeah. So when you're in an area, you're supposed to check under your vehicle yeah. if you've been there for a while, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the late summer, early fall, because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, they can just lay eggs on your vehicle, and then you drive somewhere else, and you take them to those, those things. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I was just gonna add that, that in tying it into the stewardship training, that that's a prime example of why your role as volunteering mm -hmm. on the land is valuable, because that, that landowner who might have 300 acres, now you never walk that right. part, and then one day you're out there and you see um, something like right. that. And then these can be treated, so you can call up people. and, and you know, uh, the Maryland Department of Agriculture will come and mm -hmm. eradicate that thing as quickly as possible mm -hmm. to try to keep it at bay. So your um, eyes are valuable. Yeah. Yep. The first time I saw the spotted lantern fly um, was in Pennsylvania, in Chester County. Mm -hmm. I was at Terrain, which anybody who uh, likes kind of upscale um, garden centers might find themselves in, as I did. And, you know, they import a lot of pottery and um, vessels for planting things and that's where I found my first two so you know my concern was here I am at the store and I'm driving back to Maryland <laughs> I bring anything with me yeah. I mean it's sort yeah. of what the, what the problem they had in the Midwest that everybody would know about the zebra mussel right so if you go in boating in a pond in the Midwest you actually have to clean your boat when you pull it out of that pond because there's so many zebra mussels they don't want you to inadvertently <clears throat> move them to another pond very similar with this yeah. land uh, yeah, I've seen, I went to the college in Pennsylvania, so uh, this is like ground zero for it. And we went through a site visit and uh, I think it was in Worcester Hopkins Park in Philadelphia. It was a, it was a red maple there and it was just covered in the thing. So it was just being a couple thousand of them. It was gross. 
Of course, yeah. they, they drill in, suck the sand yeah. out, and basically yeah. kill the thing. More from its honeydew yeah. poop than anything, which grows fungus. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so there's a number of problems with it. So that's one to look for. You can't miss it. And it's a lot bigger than I thought it was. Um, you know, it's actually nearly that size. Yeah. Um, and like it flew by, I was like, what is that? And then it landed and it was so obvious. Um, yeah. And I crushed it, took a photo of it, and put it online. Because uh, there, there's a portal that you can enter sites so that MDA can keep track of where people are finding them. Is um, there anything that looks at all similar? Because I remember one time I saw one and I was like quickly trying to like Google yeah, a picture no, to be no, sure no, before no, I kill yeah, it. Not, not with the red, okay. the white, okay. and the tan, yeah. and that pattern. There, no, no, no. There's a plastic one there are, in here somewhere. There are hemithra, so there are true bug. Uh, so they are yeah, like very. Pass it around. Cool. Yeah, yeah pass but, it around. Uh, people can very unique. Things. Uh, but they also, I was going to say something. Oh, they, when they take off, they look like a grasshopper jumping. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's right something right for Slow it. flying moth yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And then they take off. Yeah, I saw one in, in, near Princess Anne. Okay. Yeah, so, so if they're, they're close. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> moving south. And right. they look like a dead leaf when you're when you're folding yeah. it off. They aren't that big. No. no, they're not that big. <laughs> they're not, but, but they're bigger than a normal, yeah, like small moth that you see. You're probably about size of a quarter. Yeah, yeah. a little bit bigger. Than that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but or maybe I just saw a gigantic female. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's also another one that we have. It's called the emerald ash borer. Uh, people might be familiar with that. That's the reason that baseball players don't use ash bats anymore uh, because they entirely wiped out um, all the ash trees in the east. In essence, uh, our biggest problem is it's wiping out pumpkin ash, which is a fairly rare species of ash tree in our wetlands. Um, so be mindful that it's not just vegetation that we're looking for. Um, and if you see something like this, always take a picture of it um, if you can, um, because a picture can verify. Um, and if they want as many verified instances as they can, yeah. but just word of mouth, um, most people can tell that, but you know, they've gotten all types of reports that even with photos that they can verify were not this. Um, and then even I don't know ash borer is more difficult because we actually have a really bright green beetle um, that's a, a borer. The emerald ash borer is an emerald like that. It's actually a grayish kind of slight colored green. Uh, so always take a picture and then we can decide whether it is or isn't something bad. Again, observe, not evaluate. Um, multiflora rose, I left it to, this is our most common probably of the invasives that most people know. These things are really tasty, by the way, and full of vitamin C, um, which is why birds love them, and then they poop them all over the place, and that's why we get more and more and more and more of them. Um, and then, of course, wisteria. One species wraps this way, the other the other way. Um, that's how you can tell the two different, the Japanese and the Chinese apart. And we do have a native wisteria as well. I didn't know that either. The blooms are much more uh, smaller nowhere near as invasive and doesn't wrap and kill trees. Again, the flowers just weren't big enough for people. Uh, Oriental bittersweet is one of the things that I'm seeing is gonna be our next giant problem and it is everywhere. People brought it in and use it for Christmas decorations because the, so flower, pretty. The, the, yeah, the berries are very, very pretty and birds again, love them a lot and they will uh, tear trees down as well. Buckingham Elementary, or yeah, Buckingham Elementary has some lovely bittersweet on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, and Germantown, uh, all along the fence, has a bunch as well. Mm -hmm. um, buyers beware. So, so this is kind of scary, right? Uh, of 1,285 plants identified as invasive by the Natural Park Service, 61 percent are still available for sale in the lower 48. Mm -hmm. um, they're fairly easy to identify. If you see something that says vigorous or, you know, is naturalized or, you know, those are all things like, I love this translation, weedy and easy to escape. <laughs> That's the translation, the true translation of that. So it's a whole bunch of sort of, you know, double speak or, you know, trying to um, get you to buy something that you really don't want. Um, and then erosion control, yeah, spreads aggressively. <laughs> like, you know, so beware when you're buying something to look for these things. Um, and, and to, to know what to put on your property. Um, and then, um, we're on the soil health. Which yeah. Right. Um, I'll probably go through this a little briefly. Uh, this was a grant we did 
last 2020 and 2021 with uh, American Farmland and Trust. Uh, basically, we're coming out there and uh, we're reaching out to landowners, farmers about soil health and best practices they can use on their uh, properties and how to increase feed count and that sort of thing. Uh, so, soils are very important for um, for everything. We use soil for food, we use for agriculture. Uh, just think about every, all the uses we have of soil. Uh, they are full of microbes, uh, they are organisms all over the place, worms, whatever you got in the soil. They are very important for nutrient recycling, carbon sequestration, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, aids in decomposition, uh, we all know about that stuff. Uh, carbon sequestration, we already said that, and prevention of erosion. So if you have a soil that is not stable, doesn't have an aggregate stability, uh, you're gonna have more erosion issues. Uh, you're gonna have, you're also gonna have ponding, um, you have water in the fields, and you had that type of uh, thing going on. Uh, aggregate system of stability is very important. I think I got rid of that slide, but uh, basically it's uh, when a water comes through, it can percolate right down through the soil and visit ponds. So this is a example. On the left there, you did, that's a very stable soil. Water coming through, it's got a lot of uh, organic material in it. And on the right there is, uh, is a non-stable soil. It's rocky, it's hard. And this is what it looks like when you have differences. So you have stable, unstable. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Uh, key soil health practices. Um, number one is the use of cover uh, crop. There's a lot of programs in Maryland, and I think federal too, that uh, helps farmers who've been paid for agriculture programs for cover crops. Um, Crop rotation, so you use, use different crops during the year. Always try to keep something on the soil as much as possible. Um, I think almost every farmer I know now uses uh, no tail type of technology. Uh, but basically, that is direct drilling the seed into the ground without tilling beforehand. Um, as a lot of farmers are starting to, especially younger guys, are going through precision ag. So instead of you're using that technology still, but you're, uh, you're just the computer or whatever technology, satellite technology, is debating is like, hey, do, if you're going through the soil, you have a sandy soil here, you put like one seed in, but if you have a loamy soil, you'll put two seeds in. So it keeps on going, it reduces nitrogen where you don't need it, uh, wherever, wherever's going on there. It's a really cool technology. Uh, actually, Deere has actually just released a patent that is going through. Yeah, is Yeah, uh, they have, it's called EyeSight, and it's uh, it's a sprayer, but it, had, it uses uh, infrared radiation to depict between corn, beans, and weeds. So it's really cool. It's just direct, directly spraying the weeds. It's just really cool technology. Uh, it also minimizes disturbances, uses less uh, uses less money for chemical and fertilizer, uh, and yeah, it's really cool what these technologies are doing now. Uh, be mindful of pollinators, uh, don't mow your meadows uh, until early spring, late March, maybe early April, somewhere in there. Well, you can't, you can't mow, well, you shouldn't mow past April 15th yeah. because that's the start of the breeding season for grassland birds. Yeah. Um, so I recommend everybody start looking at it in late February, but March is probably the best season. Yeah, I usually yeah. start first, second week of March. And that way you assure that there's habitat through the worst part of the year where you need food and cover yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And this year maybe a little different. Yeah, this year you didn't need to do anything. You uh, have I just saw some of the, uh, I can't remember the bushes with the yellow flowers. I saw some of them yesterday. Oh, the Persithia. Uh, Persithia. Yeah. yeah. So. Wisteria in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you increase the soil, provides habitat, um, and only use chemicals when necessary. It's a, that's an important one. Uh, plant native plants, uh, that's pretty obvious too. And um, use pollinator uh, strips and meadows and talk to people about that. And really, really cool programs and yeah, culture. Of course, too. that's not only good for you know bees and bugs, but those are actually the pollinating vectors for the plants. So if you can put these things right next to your crops or your garden or whatever, then it helps uh, with overall pollination. Especially when we know that our bees are, 
or in mosques, both uh, are hurting badly. Uh, and so there are certain areas where people are hand pollinating the crops because they don't have enough bees to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to add mm -hmm. these things to increase the productivity yeah. of your mm -hmm. cropping. And we had these follow up flyers available if you uh, demand or request them. I can put it in the any follow up letter and that sort of thing. So we got one for soil health, one for landowners, one for homeowners. Yep. Uh, remote monitoring. So this is uh, Lens, what I was talking about earlier. And this is what Lori and Brent helped me with a lot last year. Uh, and actually, I am going to pull it up for you right now. Made it a little easier to understand what's going on. Uh, it's because we're not doing virtually this year, I'll have to go through all the slides. Uh, but yeah, so this is the uh, uh, Pomo Forest property that LC, L, LSLP owns. Um, it's an MP. So we're actually doing a cleanup on this property in March. March, March about that. Mm -hmm. March, yeah, five blitz in April or June? June 3rd. June 3rd. June 3rd. June 3rd. Okay. A lot of the blitz is basically. Hitting the property with as many sort of experts or, or uh, naturalists as you can to literally catalog every living thing that you can on the property. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see, this is an image that was taken as a high res image. And it was taken March 7, 2022. And you can see it's really pretty, all mostly forested. You get some uh, little spots here and there. Uh, I don't know if we figured out what that is yet. Did you Thousands. Yet? Oh. Actually, I think I, I looked into. I think it's an open area of marsh, but I'm not sure. It it, it actually is uh, the on the uh, topo map. It's lower, or at least uh, if I remember. Those look like so. the areas where we actually walk in. Yes. So that's yeah. Well, so that's, yeah, that's right there. Yeah, but this one is weird. Yeah, <laughs> you can't even get to that one. I can tell unless you got your fingers on. And those uh, other, the darker so ones are old barrel pits for sand ground. Yeah. So this map, this image here, it's, it goes out in 2018, but it shows the, uh, it shows the moisture. And yeah, that's what, there's, it's dry right there. Yeah, okay, so, so that's hard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's ponds on the property, you can see them pretty well. Uh, and let's go and, and go to. This was a gift of property to the land trust. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of exciting. It's the first um, conservation property that we received, and it has um, stands of old um, Atlantic white cedar, which is really special, and old cypress. Um, so we're still learning this property. The virus but, will really help us to know what's mm -hmm. possible. But we still have to monitor it. Yeah. So we're gonna... Is that in North Carolina? No, no, it's just, just right down the river here. Um, right before you the turn off to the first turn off to Pope City. There we go. All right, so yeah, this is a better map than the one before. So basically, this is a map that we can. Uh, this is taken in 2017. The last segment was 18, but it shows where the chlorophyll counts are. So we can see exactly where the deciduous trees versus the uh, the evergreens are coming in, or bold cypress. Deciduous Holly's on there too. Conifer, yes. The deciduous it. conifer, not the deciduous evergreen, which is uh, not school, I think. <laughs> but yeah, you can tell the difference. So the brighter red, that means that it's a hardwood there. Uh, mm. or this is also a great image to show the limitations of tax maps because the line is not in the middle of their field, it's yeah. actually in the woods. We know where it is, sort of. Um, but the tax maps as depicted uh, in Maryland are best representations, they're not surveys. So mm -hmm. if you look at a tax map and it looks like the line is wrong, but maybe, but it's probably not, they just probably yeah. just drew it wrong when they, when they drew it. <laughs> but yeah, this is a, a winter picture, so you can really tell where the hardwoods are. Mm -hmm. So the bright red, mm -hmm. oh, the, yeah, the, yeah, the bright red. Mm -hmm. So this would be your, uh, mostly your cypress and stuff in there. Uh, but you know, it's all the way around the winter. So that, that's where your evergreens are. Yeah. Indication of where your up is. Yeah. So the brighter the red, that means it's more colorful. So. And in the winter, that's only going to be the, the actual. It's probably all that, that's that's the winter image. Yeah. So because yeah. it yep. would be shown for a cypress then. Mm -hmm. so, well, that's true color. 
So this is a way that we can use to see what's going on in the ferry property. So we're going to get the pair, and let's say whether or not this is weird, backwards. So compare, and we'll go between 2017 and 2022. Okay, that's a really bad picture. Probably 2018. Yeah. All right. So you come through, and it's a slightly different time of year, but. Mm -hmm. There are no obvious changes to mm -hmm. what's going on, so, mm -hmm. um, except for maybe what's going on over here. <laughs> That's all the property. But, yeah. but it's really nice with these high resolution imageries. You can zoom in sort of to where mm -hmm. the farmhouse or the farmstead is and run back and forth and see if they've added a porch or if they put another shed up or something because the images are so detailed that you can really zoom in pretty close and get a, a, a really great idea of what's on the property without being too invasive to the people, you know. You can't really see them getting in and out of their car, but, yeah. you know. But yeah, you can see, you can see pretty good detail, there's ponds. You can't see the canoe, though. No. Mm -hmm. uh, Certain things you have to go on the ground. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely a good point. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty, it's really, you all this is a really pretty, pretty cool tool. So if we go in here and say, Hey, we need to go in and see what's going on. Uh, let's say we need to know what happened on uh, February 6, 2023. It's loading. Nothing happened. Uh, that's there. This, this is a, a low res. So you can go in here and say, hey, there's this. Yeah, this there's number. no openings. In this the is the difference so. between low res and high res. Okay. So this is, yeah, it's a big blur. It's close. Yeah, but we can go in here and The say, further hey, out you zoom, the clearer it becomes. Yeah. Just bigger pixels. Yes. Yeah. And it also gives you a buffer area. Uh, all, you can also zoom, uh, hover over and see what Oak Creek Creek, oh, there's a still tree creek going through there, and Oak River, of course. Yeah, I believe that's the vibe. The vibe increases. So yeah, that's an overview of lens and uh, we go in here and take notes and take a note and that's how you report. And it's a whole protocol for that. So yep. And it reduces your time in monitoring by taking away the driving and the cost mm -hmm. of the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said earlier, you can see the whole property. Yeah. Even though you can't see it from the ground level, but you yeah. can actually see from corner to corner to corner. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you're covering 100% of the property where in the ground visit, you might only be covering 20 or 40 or 60, depending on what you can get to and what's reasonable for your ground visit. Um, so it, it just gives you a whole lot more opportunity to see the property uh, fully. This is pretty cool. But this is, uh, this is this tool here you can help you to sort of pick up buffers. Uh, this is a vegetation tool. And we can actually go in and say, we need to, let's analyze the digger, this, let's say this, this little area here we're trying to figure out. And we go with buffers. And then go in here, it'll load. And the last time I saw this load today, mm -hmm. as usual. <laughs> it's like a, there you go. But yeah, it shows you uh, the average values. And what I usually do is an area range. And go in here and pick pretty high. And now you can see where the peaking is. So if you come in here and say, uh, this is peaking every year, and then 2021, 21, 22 is nothing there, we know it's a buffer issue. So what's the, the, the 20? Right, right here? 20. What happened there? I'm not quite sure. But, but yeah, so <laughs> obviously well, maybe it's nothing. Right it might just be a, a defect in the data or yeah. something like that, because you can see that there's stuff there. The, the but, last two years, so yeah. nobody cut it, but so you have to double check. But, yeah. Um, also, if you find it's like it's high, 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 and then drops off low and then gradually goes back up, right? That means there's something happened somewhere. Yeah, and then it's yeah. regrowing. So it's yeah. basically showing you yeah. the what chlorophyll output at a, yeah. any given time. So yeah. in the you know middle of the summer, it's going to be the most chlorophyll output of the area. But if you <laughs> cut it all down, the 
gross amount of chlorophyll is going to be much lower, even if everything's growing back. It's just going to be less biomass to produce that signature. Yeah, this so, yeah. is information that we are generally not using for yeah. you know our general monitoring practices. Yeah. But this would be yeah. you know used for future restoration projects or. Mm -hmm looking at different types of, of activities that lower shore land trusts could get involved I've actually had to use it twice, so. Because yeah. of? A potential violation mm -hmm. yeah. of the Chris Field. Mm -hmm. So there was a neighbor cut down a section of stuff off their property that was on an easement property. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, we didn't do it, and we didn't do it this time, whatever, and we can go back and show exactly, exactly. what we did it. Sure, but you're not using the chlorophyll. You're not necessarily. No, he was using yeah. this tool because it, it it showed in that it, area it really should drop been, off and okay. then and we're not now we're you know stagnant um, for a couple of years right. and, yeah you know and now it's getting better because it's okay. two years on yeah so it is useful this is the evaluation tool if you see something then we can mm -hmm. go back and check and see what <coughs> exactly what happened great so yeah. you take a picture we find out where it is and then we can go back and see what happened yeah. and you can time. also like you can you can isolate one little area and zoom in on it too yeah. so you pick Which one little corner or yep. something yep. Yep. just kind of cool so that tool is really useful for us, especially on our landscape. But you can see how useful for the, the Western, that they might have an easement that's 40,000 acres, mm -hmm. one easement. Um, and so there's no way you could go to that. I mean, you'd be there for three weeks trying to, <laughs> to monitor it. So they can cover those a lot easier out West. Um, but it's really helpful for us because of our landscape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so pros, like we were talking about earlier, you can see the entire property, uh, see buffers clearly, um, uh, you can see land walls, it's really cool, I have a whole slide about that in a second. Cons is, uh, sometimes it's not as accurate, so you go out there and say, hey, there's a, there's a wet spot, you go out on the ground itself, there's no wet spot, so like Beth was talking about back earlier. Uh, there is a reduced frame variations there as well, uh, which is, and a part sad, but we also have, like we had a couple times last year, had a planner come in and uh, they look at the property with us, which is kind of cool, get to talk about it and go through. Uh, and you, the leaf on visibility, uh, when you have a March photo, really easy to see stuff going on. You have one in June, like that one photo I had of, of the uh, other property, can't see. So, that's the uh, cons there. And of course, we're, much of our landscape is always leaf on because we're so pine dominant um, that it doesn't matter as yeah. much for us. Um, but it, yeah. you know, in in Western Maryland, it's much more useful because they almost entirely hardwood. But um, you know, it's yeah. still uh, coastal marshes. We uh, can also use that to see exactly. Where lands can evolve. So this is a property done by Chris Steele. And you can see a survey from 1969. There's a lot of land there. That's what's left there. Yeah, so the, so, yeah, yeah. the, the drawing up top, that's yeah. all land yeah. and marsh. And then so, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's become islands. And, yeah. uh, some things are entirely gone. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the survey was 341 acres at one time. And now it's from that, it's like 240 or something. Yeah. I was looking at it in the 90s. And so that's here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Uh, oh, this is uh, this is an example of what we're looking for. Uh, so this is a little spot. We went out there and ground checked it. So it was just a little hunting. You know. So this is stuff we're looking for. You want in here. And, a lot of trees and you see a random spot sticking over there. So, and yeah, it's zoomed in like so. Big box, big little box around it. And that was one Jerry and I went yeah, out there. Yeah, we went out and checked to make sure everything was good. We met yep. the, the consultant out there, oh, yeah. and um, yeah, everything looked fine. Took a few photos and realized that it had been there for years. <laughs> yeah. so. It's a hunting encampment. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that, that property is also 800 and some acres, so you don't get to walk it all. Mm -hmm. You get to see what might be there. Uh, yeah, this is vegetation. Now, we went through this tool a little bit earlier, but you can see in here, high, 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 this down. So, 
the Esper group release with the Dallas Digger and exactly what's going on. And then you can actually get a number, or spit out a number when it was and what the uh, analysis was and how, how many points you dropped off. And it was, and it was shared that whoever needs to know about it. So, yeah. Uh, compare tool, I showed you that guys a little earlier, but you can, it's a good example. Yeah, forest, no forest. So, mm -hmm. Frank, what like compare tool? What, how far back do you want us to go back to compare? Uh, what I like to do is 2022, or the most recent image, mm -hmm. and then the Maryland six inch imagery. That's the most clear image. So, be 2019. Three years. It's 2019. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Yeah, well, so they just blew it again, so we will have the 2022 uploaded sometime whenever they get to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every three years they fly. Yeah. And so the and the western shore is on a different rotation mm -hmm. than the eastern shore. So, so hopefully we get that soon. So right now I'll still use the 2019 for compare. That yeah. the six inch imagery is even better. Yeah. Than the right now. <laughs> yeah. It's our high resolution. Uh, we also get some uh, 0 0.3 meter. So, mm -hmm. but it's six inch imagery is like. Way to yes. go when you can get it. So, yep. Any mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Discovery Center for me. Yeah. So, so I think, think that's tough because I remember everything. <laughs> but, you know, when you do the, the field part, um, then you'll, you'll take all of this into actual practice. And when you walk around on the ground, this will make a lot more sense. As to what we're looking for, how we do things, um, and and sort of what to expect in future times uh, going out. But it's uh, it can be really fun. I think um, I don't get to do it enough. Um, I, I spend too much time drafting easements um, and not enough time walking properties. Um, but you all got lucky because every time you go out, it's a new property. It's something you probably haven't seen, um, and it, it's just a great experience to be able to get on the properties that you'll never get access to otherwise um, and see some really cool stuff. And hopefully no bad things. <laughs> <laughs> like a new kind of enemy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, same thing about that. Uh, so say if a landowner comes up to you and asks like, hey, we, what do you guys do? Uh, what I usually say is we're looking for you know, like new trash piles. Uh, we're looking for movie theaters, condos. That sort of thing. So just keep it light fluffy. Yeah. Yeah. You're nice and light and fluffy. I, I generally am more along the lines of, you know, we really enjoy our annual stewardship visits and try to provide resources. So we've done our homework ahead of time. We know that somebody might have the opportunity for a wetland or for an enhanced buffer. We might deliberately bring that additional information mm -hmm. to them in a proactive way. And hopefully we get to meet with the landowner out there because as, as the slide said, they really are some fun yeah. folk. I mean, one or two bad apples maybe, but generally most people that do easements have, are just a little different in the mindset. Yeah. And um, they're really fun to talk to. It's great to know what their family's doing, what their plans for the property are. They'll know the Very history of the property. Of property. Yeah, they're just really yeah. proud of it. I mean, most of the time, I mean, there's, a, there's definitely a difference between landowners. Owner, owner operators are more, they're out of the business, you know, it's a business decision. I'm keeping my operation afloat. And, and then, then your estate owners and uh, people that lease their uh, rights out tend to be much more. But then you have the owner operators that have had a family farm for 150 years. And they're very similar to, in my, my opinion, to the to the estate owners that have, um, mm -hmm. that just have that deeper connection with it because it's such a long part of their family. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And they want to protect, protect it and preserve it and hope that their grandchildren's grandchildren don't, you know, develop 200 lots on it you know, and, and do away with the forest and the, the ag. Yeah. So. yeah, I just want to add, this, this program, our land steward program, is probably one of the most important things that we do. Um, in 20, 2006, in the olden days when I came on board, <laughs> uh, we didn't have any outreach. We, we had not done any kind of, uh, very li little, there hadn't been any monitoring of maybe a quarter of the properties had been monitored. So it was, you know, in some cases, 10 years after an easement was put in place and all of a sudden a landowner's getting a call from me saying I'm coming out and then a few years later we're coming out annually. 
So they were really surprised. Um, and why we do this is because it's really important, as, as both Frank and Jared said, when a land changes hands, that's when you're most prone to that kind of violation. Even though by state law, the seller is supposed to give the buyer a copy of the easement. It's, they have to check a box that they've done that in the, in the um, transfer papers, but it doesn't always happen as nicely as we think. So that's when we need to come on board. But when we started doing this type of outreach and for most of our easement grantors, they, they've been welcoming, they like it, they want to, you know, they like us. For the few that just don't get it, you know, we just have to do our job and we do it the best we can. But m most of our easement grantors, especially the ones that we've worked with, you know, since 2006 and then even more since Jared's come on board, we have a real relationship with them. Um, and many times, you know, they let us do events out on their properties. We've gone and done bird walking. We've done, we did an anniversary event at one of our landowner properties when it was our 25th anniversary. And we had a, they opened up their house to us. We had a, a, just a lovely reception. So there's some really exciting things that can happen, you know, and it's it's you all being part of our team. So yeah, thank and, you. And don't be scared to sit and talk with them for a while. Frank and I went out to a new landowner just this week, hadn't met him, and we spent two and a half hours with him. We didn't need to, but, but that, talking to them, making them realize you're real people, you're concerned about the same thing, you wanna know what they're doing. Um, it's just a, a great experience. Um, and then they're just more likely to contact you. And you know, uh, we talked about, they got a quail postcard from Katerina, and so they asked about that. We talked about all those things. So it's just a great way to get to know people um, and, and you know, cultivate that relationship that needs to be cultivated to make our jobs easier and, and to make that relationship smooth. Um, and so when they do want to come and ask about you know, realizing that house right that they have, it's a really easy conversation and, and, and they understand what's going on, they understand where we're coming from, we understand where they're coming from, and it's just so much easier to deal with. Um, so. All right. How, how do you, uh, when, when, it, when the land does is sold, is there some way to make it more clear that this is in an easement? I mean, <laughs> we, so the problem is when um, there are landowners, particularly here in the coast, in the lower shore, that sell their property without using a, a realtor. Um, or and, a title company for yeah. them. And so yeah. Joe's like, oh, I've known Sam forever. Right. And so Sam sells them a property and, and it's like, like, oh, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Maryland Tax and Assessment. Uh, office has what's called real property and it, it's available online and it tells you who owns the property and all of these things about the property. Yeah. Does we it have, say that in it? No. no. We've petitioned as a land trust community for them to add a checkbox for a conservation easement. Yeah. They will not do it. Yeah. There's a place for a survey, like for a house, credit. how many square feet, but not about an easement. Credit, whatever that's called. They should yeah, but they 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 just don't want to do it for I don't know why. Um, but it's in and it's in the land records. It's not like you're telling somebody that's secret. You know, this is all public record stuff. So it just I don't know why they won't. But we we've, we've been on them. Um, there's a, a group that we work with um, that's sort of the statewide. We'll call them I don't know, sort of consultants, sort of uh, I don't whatever. But anyway, they they advocate for different things. They're called partners for open space. Um, they're very useful uh, in the state, and um, they, they advocate for full funding of the programs and all of that, and they've been on <laughs> that, but I think we've basically given up because they have not done it. <laughs> so we have to be on it, and um, you know, Frank, like he says, he checks that real property page when he goes out to make sure we're dealing with the same person that we were. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes we find out Ooh, it was old and yeah. didn't tell us. <laughs> and if uh, property owners already mentions they have it's up for sale, I'll go on their random windows and check on it and the lab and, and stuff. We also have fairly decent relationships with our counties. Um, and for instance, in Worcester County, Catherine Munson uh, does the preservation programs, but she also is like the permitting and whatever office. So if she realizes that there's an easement on the property when she's going through to do the permitting, she'll let us know. 
Now, Somerset doesn't quite have the staff, and they keep <laughs> rotating over, so it's it, it's harder for them to do it. Um, so we probably look a little bit more at Somerset because we don't get that um, kind of support from the Planning and Zoning Office, but it's not because they don't want to, it's just more likely because they can't. Um, and Lycomico is pretty good too. Frank McKenzie will give me a call and say, hey, there's a forest um, permit for forestry hanging or something like that. And then we can go out, make sure that, that that's fine with the use and etc. So having those good relationships with the county uh, is important. So sometimes we bring out the white gloves with the county so we don't <laughs> ruin that relationship. So that's very important to us. Okay. Okay. Anything else, Kate? No. I mean, I think we've got some great upcoming events, and um, you know, again, we've got a, a great board of directors that's helping us to um, you know deliver these programs to you and you guys are now part of the team and um, you know love to hear from you we'll be sending out you know periodic surveys too just to see what you all want to hear about we're in the process of planning a, another bird series um, that that's really engaged with which is great and um, we have a series of events coming up um, as well besides our native plant sale and pollinator garden tour yeah. Uh, so, upcoming date for stewardship. Uh, advanced training is March 1st uh, for the older guys come on by. and uh, the older guys from which training? Yeah, Frank. <laughs> 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 put up a <laughs> But uh, meet here at 10 a.m. on the 1st. They will go out from there. Uh, and then the all levels training is Friday and Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. Keep on your emails. I'm still Pick trying to confirm. Uh, it's either yeah. or, the third or the fourth. You can yeah. do both if you want. Yeah. You want to do both? The weather looks good. I'm doing both. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right, too. Uh, and then uh, monitoring dates coming up uh, February 22nd, 23rd. Uh, have people for both of those days already. Uh, do you want to come out? Shoot me an email or text, whatever I do. Uh, and then March 7th, 8th, 9th, and 11th, I don't have many of those days yet. Uh, I'd sent out a doodle poll. Uh, I think I have a couple people on that doodle poll for those days. Uh, also, that doodle poll has everything up to March, uh, April 1st or something yeah. like that now. So, uh, yep. Yeah. Actually, one thing we didn't really cover is uh, we our monitoring dates are sort of structured after hunting season. So usually about February 1st, we can get out. We tend to delay a little bit the weather, although we <laughs> need to this year. Um, and then we can basically monitor fairly straight all the way till turkey season opens in mid-April. Some of our landowners don't turkey hunt, don't mind us being out there, um, but we always ask the landowner, do you hunt deer, do you hunt whatever, and then we base our visits where we can around those dates. We don't do much in the summer for obvious reasons. We don't want any of you falling out from heat exhaustion to get, you know, undo tick diseases or uh, jiggers, heaven forbid. Um, <laughs> and then we have a short period of time in the fall that we can monitor before um, the, the main hunting seasons open up. Um, we're out there a little bit during early teal season and morning dove season, but really it's when you get into the deer seasons down here that's you know, and especially we don't go out at all during uh, firearm season for deer. That's a bad idea to be up in the woods then. So that, that's kind of the idea of like the general schedule over the year. Um, and we don't do a lot in the midwinter, obviously because of the hunting seasons, but when yeah. we can or we have to, we work with the land and we get out there. Uh, yep, so yeah, I keep buying your emails. Uh, I'll send around a doodle pool again Monday. Uh, if you don't have a uh, stewardship manual already, uh, let me know. I can print you a copy. Uh, I'm also on that email Monday. I'll send you all another copy of it. Uh, if you want a physical copy, just deal at me today. Uh, if you have not signed the waiver forms and the uh, what was it, the procedures form, uh, come on up here freely and have my file. That would yeah. be great. So it's there. Yeah. And you have to help us finish some of these. Sweets and fruits and potatoes in the back. Have a snack, you know, it's a long drive home. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, did yes. you already send out the uh, monitoring dates 
Yeah. They'll send it. Oh, I'll still give him my money. I don't remember. Yeah, that's why I texted you. Come visit with us in case we need to.